Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cup of Joe. I have a very, very special guest today. It is Fitchy Bethay. He was on the very first national championship team. And for all you newcomers, I do not mean the one in 2016. I mean the one back in 1981. He also coached at Tulsa and Catawba, and his biggest accomplishment is being my dad. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, honey. Thank you for you know letting me make you come here. <laughs> So to get started, after seeing Clemson play two games, what do you think they're doing well and what needs to change? Well, this year they seem to be just filling the spots that they lost last year very well. Uh, offense, they don't seem to have it just dialed in, but you don't expect them to be dialed in by the second game. Uh, line play in the Georgia Tech game, I thought the offensive line was a star. Yesterday I thought they Needed a little help, but then Texas A&M was probably one of the better defensive lines, more athletic and strong and talented lines they'll see. So, you know, going forward, complacency will be their biggest foe. Mm -hmm. Now, to get more into personal questions, as I said before, you were on the very first national championship team that Clemson football had ever had in their entire program. What was it like to be the very first champion for Clemson football? Well, one... Going into that year, we came off a six and five year mm -hmm. in 80. And Very so, unexpected. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of t talk about that Ford was on the hot seat, you know, that if we didn't have a good year. So, you know, of course everybody wanted to have a great year because of that, but in those days, a great year was winning the ACC. Uh, you know, we never really even considered winning a national championship going in the year. We were more or less shooting to win the ACC and, have, you know, beating South Carolina. Uh, after we beat Georgia, that was really when the first time, I forgot which one of our coaches came in that had coached somewhere that, and came in and walked in and they held up, this is a national championship room. This is what we're shooting for now. And that was the first time it was actually mentioned. And, you know, everybody kind of, you know, because Georgia just won the national championship in 80. And a lot of people don't realize or remember, we went to Sanford Stadium our fresh, my freshman year when I say we, I was a walk-on. I didn't even get to travel that game. And we lost, I think it was either 24-17, 24-14. And Scott Warner had an interception return and a punt return for a touchdown. And we really felt like we had outplayed them and just lost mm -hmm. on two big plays. And one of Ford's big things was always saying three or four plays decide a game. And we talked, kind of talked them after that game. And that team won the national championship. By far was one of the best in the country. And we felt like we had outplayed them. So... Mm -hmm. After we had beaten Georgia the next year, we felt like, hey, you know, we can do it. And also, some of y'all might not realize going into that year, coming off of six and five, we weren't even ranked. And that mm -hmm. year, there was only a top 20. And we, I don't remember who we beat the first game. I, uh, I don't remember who we played. It might have been Walford. Mm -hmm. But uh, the second game when we beat Georgia, you know, they came, the rankings didn't come out until Monday night. And we were having a Monday night run through. And, uh, one of the coaches wife said, hey, we're ranked like 16th or 17th. And, you know, wow, we're ranked. You know, it was a big deal to be ranked. It's not like it is now where, you know, if you're Always not ranked number one. <laughs> you know, in the one, two, or three in the country, we're disappointed. We were in the top 20. Whoa, you know, that was great. And it was neat. Through that year, it was, you know, we felt like every team, on, you know, we could be every team, but every team could beat us, we felt. So we, after each win, we climb a little bit, climb a little bit climb a little bit and it got down. In fact, at the end of the year, things went our way because we ended the year number two. And it took uh, Todd Blackledge having an unbelievable game against Pittsburgh with Dan Marino and beating them for us to jump them and go to number one. Because that made us the only undefeated team but Pittsburgh would have been undefeated. And that year they ended up beating Georgia in the Sugar Bowl so we wouldn't have been national champions even mm -hmm. if we'd have been undefeated because Pittsburgh would have been undefeated and they would have got it instead of us. So things that fell our way that year, but you know, we earned it and it was kind of, you know, a magical trip to go from not even worrying about hoping to win the ACC to winning a national championship and beating three top 10 teams. North Carolina was considered by far the favorite going into that year in the ACC. They were a top five team. We beat them, we beat Georgia who was number one or two when we beat them, and then beat Nebraska at the end of the year, who was, I think, fourth when we beat them. Now, what was it like after, like the season after, you know, seeing fans? How are you treated differently? How did it feel differently, you know, being in Death Valley the year after and, 
you know, when you meet at the Paul, like what was it different? Like when you would come into contact with fans? Well, the, the thing I remember the most from that year is I actually got to travel that year as a walk on and we beat North Carolina in Chapel Hill that year, late in the year, the first time ever two, either two top five or two top 10 teams that played each other in the ACC and we beat them in a very close game. And we fly back into Greenville Spartanburg. You felt, it, it reminded me of the videos of the Beatles flying in or something. <laughs> there was just literally 10 or 15,000 people. Felt like a rock star. Felt like a rock star. And that's what, from then on, that's kind of what it felt like. You go to, like, and a lot of people know, we'd go to Anderson mm -hmm. on Friday nights or some, if we were staying in a away game, we'd go to a hotel, but there'd be people wanting your autograph all the time. People screaming for you, hollering for you, great. You, you all, all of a sudden, the little Clemson family exploded. You, know, you got a lot more people being Clemson fans. All of a sudden, there were <laughs> Clemson fans everywhere. You know, you know, there's a lot of shirts that were other colors. All of a sudden, people put on an orange shirt after that, in going into that year, and it was just everywhere you went. I mean, it didn't matter who you were. They wanted your autograph. They want, you know, and it was. It was a very egotistical, you know, heady thing to get police escorts everywhere mm -hmm. needing them. You know, it, it was a lot of fun, but all of a sudden it was a, it was a change. You know, I imagine they had it earlier in the, like 77 and 78, which is really what set the groundwork. Uh, I, anytime I meet someone that's on the 77, 78 team, those were like Steve Fuller, Dwight Clark, Jim Stuckey. I was at a thing somewhere and talking to Jim Stuckey, and I thanked him because those two teams set the groundwork for what we have at Clemson now. Those two teams were the first teams to really go on a national scale. That, in fact, I think they were the first ones to beat Georgia and Athens ever for Clemson or in like 50 years. So those two teams set the groundwork for us to be a contender in the national stage. And, you know, when we got there, it was a very, you know, fun but heady trip to have all that. You talk about setting the groundwork. Do you think that the players now should thank y'all for, you know, setting a foundation of being a championship program? I don't know about thank us, but just realize that, you know, 77 and 78 were the first teams to put Clemson, I don't know, since maybe Banks McFadden days on a national scale. I mean, they were, you know, in 78, when they beat, uh, who was it they beat? No, not Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh beat them to death. It, it, it was Ohio State they beat in the, uh, uh, the Woody Hayes punch game is when we won that one, 11 and one ended up in the top 10. That was the first team to take Clemson into the national mm -hmm. spotlight and set the stage for us to become national champions and, you know, reach the top of the mountain. So they just need to realize that it wasn't just the Dabo years that did it. You know, we had some up and down, but those years in the late seventies and eighties, were the years that more or less set Clemson up to be a national power. And now, you know, one of the teams, you know, that you don't have a conversation now in the nation without Clemson being in it. Mm -hmm. Now, as you mentioned, you were a walk-on. He was a walk-on ride receiver. And when I say walk-on, I mean cold, hard, crawl on. So what, because I mean, Clemson football didn't know who you were when you stepped on campus. No. What encouraged you or inspired you to want to become a Clemson football player, and what was that process like? Well, I grew up a Clemson fan. My father played here in 38. My best friends were all Clemson. You know, I'd go to Clemson games when I was in junior high and buy the jersey of whoever, you know, Dwight Clark, uh, Jerry Butler, and Warren Radsford, Steve Fuller, the original four. <laughs> no cut to Sean, but he was the original four. And uh, just always wanted to be there. And I never really thought of I played at a 4A high school, Dylan. We were really good. But I never really thought about playing major college football. But I had a friend, Bob Hardaway, who was going to be a walk-on. I said, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And came up here. And, I mean, my, it, it was a very slow start. My first uh, two games, I, I was sitting in the stand. They didn't even allow me to dress the very first couple games. You know, and that I know was, you told me you had people ask you, you like, know, hey, aren't you playing? You're like, yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> you know, I'd talk to people, people running the people from home, I'd be tailgating, and I think the first game my freshman year was Rice. And, you know, I thought you said you were walking on. You know, what you, I am, but, you know, I didn't rate even dressing out the first couple home games. Because in those days, I think we had like 115 or 130 walk-ons and they let anyone and that's the only way I got to walk on anyone who wanted to be a walk-on and you became an LTD we called them in those days a live tackling dummy and you know they let you cut yourself and you know it would be a, a tough road for a, 
a lot of people and then you know everyone cut themselves and you know, by the end of the year out of those 130 we were probably down to 20 25 of those walk-ons and, and i think by the my fourth year i think there was only four three four five of us left from uh, from 135 a lot of it's perseverance dumb luck being in the right place at the right time you know maybe someone one or two people getting hurt and you getting bumped up if you if you had the persistence to stay but it's you know it, it, in fact nowadays with the way the NCA set up I would never get to walk on now from the time you played way back in the 80s from now mm -hmm. what is the biggest difference you have seen maybe in the culture you know in the way that Clemson plays what to you has stood out um, the main thing is the wide openness of the offense and the way points are scored now and the number of plays and we would run 55, maybe 65 plays a game. Now Clemson might run 100 plays in a game. Mm -hmm. We carried four or five wide receivers on road trips. Now you have four or five wide receivers at a time, at a on, time. on the field. You know, I think I had two catches one year and like the fourth leading receiver. <laughs> you know, you couldn't have two catches in a game and be the fourth leading yeah. receiver now. Uh, you know, it's it's just such a wide open uh, offensive game. and. The rules have changed to where if you look at a wide receiver wrong now, you get a, a, a interference mm -hmm. call where we used to get mugged and they wouldn't call it. I mean, it was a lot more physical, I think. It was an offensive running game. You know, you know we ran the eye. We, we run the ball. three. You know, a, a big score with 21 or 31, even though we did score 70 against Wake Forest or 77. No, 82. We scored 82 against Wake Forest. You don't even you, hear that number today. And uh, But, you know... A good offensive day was 350 yards. Now you need 350 yards of passing to, to go along with 200 yards of, of running. Uh, and it's just, you know, you'd have, like we had Perry Tuttle was our deep, deep threat wide receiver. Our possession was uh, Jerry Guillard from Yuma, Arizona. And, uh, you know, it was just a very defensive run oriented game where now it's a wide open, you know, if you, like, people, I was leaving the Texas A&M and people were kind of shocked when they scored 24 points. Mm -hmm. That was a good game in those days. It wasn't unusual to see 17, 14, 10 to 3, where now that, that's unheard of. Um, now, what was it like to be a wide receiver on a team that ran the ball most of the time? You learned to block. You learned to block. And you learned to block. <laughs> and, you know, that's every, probably why you did so well because you played defense in high school. I played defense in high school. How I got my most of my game time was I was be a slot receiver and and I was pretty uh, weightlifting oriented and so I was fairly strong so I didn't mind crack back like so we could crack back in those days you could hit linebackers you know as long as you kept your head in front blindside them and uh, it, it was a you know you didn't even think about getting the ball hardly you know it was rare that you got the ball thrown and if it was thrown it was usually a one or two receiver route. You know, every once in a while they might have a three receiver route. If you got into uh, where you were trying to score at the end of a game or something, you might have four receivers with one being the tight end. But, you know, it's, it was just a completely different game. Now, unless you're old school, you don't realize that when they played football, they lived in Malden, which is a dorm on the east side of campus. And to quote Jeff Davis, he called it Malden Motel. So what was it like to live in Malden Motel with all the players? Well, I loved it. I mean, in fact, <laughs> one of my, another one of my best friends was a guy named David Strickland who played baseball at Clemson. He used to call it the country club because <laughs> it was all receivers. It was, a, it was a, at that time one of the nicer dorms. We had our own dining facility. If you're that everybody that's living in Malden right now, it is one of the nicer doors. It, we had our own dining facility down, down under Sledder. And uh, the reason we had our own dining facility, only the people that ate there were the football team, the managers, the trainers from the football team, the basketball team, and their trainers and managers. And we do that because at those times there was no rules of how long you could practice. And it wasn't unusual for Ford, you know, an hour and a half into practice, say, this isn't cutting it. We're starting over from stretching, and we might not. We might go down there at one and come back at ten at night. And the only you know, dining, normal dining halls have been long closed and gone, and we didn't have other places to eat like y'all do now. We had either Sledder or Harkham, and that was it. And so, but our food was better than the average person today. <laughs> y'all probably wouldn't think so. Like we had a sandwich bar, we thought that was a big deal, mm -hmm. and we could get steaks a lot of times. And but you know. It, it was still cafeteria style, and we had two ladies that we all knew, Sarah, and I don't remember the other one's name that took care of us. But it was it was it was kind of like almost being in a fraternity though, because we 
lived together, slept together, ate together, worked together, and became some of your best friends from college or those people that you played ball with because you lived with them. Mm-hmm. You know, you, we'd get here early in uh, early August, move in, and we couldn't wait for everybody to come in, you know, and help all the girls move into the high rise <laughs> and get to meet them, all the sorority just girls. Just because you wanted to help, right? Yeah, that's right. Just wanted to help. Maybe all the sorority girls. The other two dorms that are still sorority dorms. Yep, sorority, I, I lived in one of them last year. Where, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we loved when everybody else showed up because... You know, it was fun to see everybody. That meant, and that meant camp was over, which was great because we would practice three times a day. And one I used to hate was the early morning one because you'd be out there when they just cut the grass. The dew would be on the grass. It'd be hot. You'd be got grass sticking to you. You get wet. Your shoes would weigh ten pounds, and you know you're getting ready to get hammered by somebody that weighs three hundred pounds. Sounds like the life. It was, but, it, <laughs> but you know, it was fun. We enjoyed it. Do you think that the team now misses out on you know getting to like know each other since they don't yes, live in the dorm? Yes, I do. Now, they do seem to have a very good cohesiveness, but I think it would really be better if you had an athletic dorm. You know, we were under lock and key, too. You know, the, we had a, a coach lived in the bottom of the dorm, Lawson Holland, who actually was my coach, a receiver's coach. But, you know, we had curfew. They'd wake us up in the morning with an air horn we're running down the halls. The managers would run up and down the hall. People would throw, open the door. That poor manager. Yeah, you know, <laughs> would throw cleats at them. In fact, one of my best friends now is a gentleman y'all might know around Clemson named Jim Weldon. If you don't know Jim Weldon, he drives the short bus. But, it, uh, you know, we all, managers, trainers, football players, you know, we all became good friends because we lived together. And like I said, we'd be under curfew and, and, you know, someone would skip curfew and get caught and have to run the stadium. But it was, it, it, it made a real family atmosphere, which I don't know if they have as close of, as we did back then. Now, my favorite and last question, what, besides the national championship, what is your best or craziest or funniest story that you can tell us from your time of playing at Clemson football? Uh, one of, well, this would be one of them. We had a defensive back named Anthony Rhodes. We called him Spook. And <laughs> now, why did you call him Spook? I don't know. I mean, did I don't he know. spook people? I mean, he, <laughs> he played. He was a starting defensive back, and his little mantra was always, "When me and Room starts, we never lost." And when him, Anthony Rhodes, and Hollis Hall started corners, we never lost a game. And he was uh, from where was he from? He was from uh, a small high school in Sumter County. I forget it's one Furman or one of them. Anyway, we were. Uh, you could tell Ford was not happy. And he was in the tower and cussing us and getting on us. And mm-hmm. Spook actually just left practice, walked up the tower and said, Coach, what do you see to be the problem to practice today? <laughs> and he said, get your sorry self back on that field right now if you want to play. But, and then you could tell Ford was laughing, and that broke the tension, you know, because it was kind of one of those days everybody was at everybody, and, and he was kind of, I just, that sticks out in my mind. And, uh, and like I say, and Anthony, I mean, he wasn't real big. Uh, to give you an idea, he was probably 5'9", 170, but I remember a, a play real vivid one year. It was either my sophomore or junior, one of the years, we were playing at South Carolina. So that either had been 83 or 81, because we played, you play there, as you all know, mm-hmm. on odd years. They had a, uh, is he the backer receiver of, uh, I think his name was Ricky Haygood. No, don't hold me to that. But he was running a drag route. Mm-hmm. And it was a close game. And Spook hit him right in the chest. In fact, nowadays they'd probably call it targeting and throw him out. At least he led with his helmet, hit him in the chest. He landed on his back and bounced. And then he just stood up, stood, set up and just kind of exhaled. And you could tell after that play, mm-hmm. Carolina was whipped. And, it, and Haygood was twice the size of Spook. But Spook just lead him up. And I mean, and like I say, nowadays, I'm sure he'd probably be thrown out for targeting. That's an, I understand all that, but to me, they've taken a little bit of, that was part of being a receiver. You had to be willing to take shots, shots like man. that to play receiver. You know, you know, they're protecting us, and I understand that. People get concussions, bad long term. But that was part of the, you know, the thing. You, and that's what you always told me growing up is why you think you got to play is because you could run fast and you could take a hit. Yeah, I mean, or a lot of, not as much take it a hit is learn how to get hit and not just get annihilated. Mm-hmm. Learn to just torque your body a little, go with it. You know, learning how not to get injured. I mean, that was part of being a receiver in those days, learning how to take a hit and not have it just hurt you. Mm-hmm. That was, you know, because you, know, you knew you were going to get, if you ran drag routes across the middle, you were going to get lit up. 
And nowadays they're taking that away some because of all this uh, targeting rule. Like I say, I understand it's good, you know, because you, you did have people out there head hunting trying to hurt people. But a lot of it was just intimidation. You know, they really weren't trying to permanently hurt you, but they were trying to make you hurt and not want to do it yeah. again. To get up on another soapbox, I think you've got to find a way to realize like when somebody's actually tackling and when they're doing it out of malicious intent. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know as a ref, that's hard to you yeah. know, tell sometimes, but. And they always had the penalty to me, uh, unsportsmanlike conduct. They never used it like they should. Cause like you said, you knew when you could tell when someone was, mm -hmm. you know, just hitting someone, trying to hurt them and take them out of the game, which shouldn't be done. But there was also trying to hit them and send a message. You come across my middle, you're going to pay the price. And that was how it was. And that's what we didn't throw the ball. And you couldn't throw the ball like that because you could get mugged. Well, thank you so much for being here, Dad, even though you didn't really have a choice. <laughs> I'm Joanne Bethay here with the Clemson Insider. Keep up with us as we have full coverage of the 2019 Clemson football season.